with it so we can hopefully catch some of the daylight. Um, anyway, thank you all for coming. As Susie said, we're really excited to get started again. Um, and as I volunteered to be one of the first events back, which is always a little stressful, but hopefully you'll take something from it. I'm Louisa, I'm a lecturer in fashion communication, so I'm normally in here um, teaching. But I also run two fashion businesses, uh, the details of which I will share with you later, because there are elements of Kitchener and lots of colour and lots of print. So I tend to spend a lot of time thinking about what people wear, but also the visual aspects of life in general, what that means for us, for our identities, our shared culture, and our understanding of the world as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what kitsch is, look at the definition of that. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of where we can find kitsch, and then finally I'm going to consider whether there is any value in kitsch. So one thing that I would like to ask you is, what do you think of when you hear the word kitsch? What immediately springs to mind? Garish colour. Garish colour? Loud. Loud. Any particular objects? Three dots. Three ducks, yeah. <laughs> Little rubber ducks, or lots of wool. Yeah, tacky, retro, retro. Anything that's been overused, like Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo, yeah. Anything on lawns? Gnomes. Gnomes. Yeah, the quintessential garden gnome. Pink flamingos as well. What about places? Are there any places that are kitsch? Disneyland, absolutely. Blackpool. Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> Las Vegas. <laughs> Kitsch, as you have just demonstrated, um, aims at being universal. Okay, It tries to aestheticize or make beautiful the ordinary. But often it does so much so that the original motif becomes a bit of a caricature of itself. Okay, Everything is a little too exaggerated, a bit too shiny, a bit too frilly, a bit too overworked, a bit too overdone. Disney's characters kind of look a little too plasticky in their satin costumes. Jesus here emitting a sort of almost alien-like neon green glow, and the garden gnome's cheeks look almost kind of maniacally flush. So, Kitsch definitely has something that is slightly unsettling. Okay, now the etymology, the origins of the word kitsch is an interesting one. It's commonly thought to derive from the German word kitchen, meaning, and bear with me on this one, des Tassenschlamm aus Schachen, which means to collect rubbish from the street. Trust the Germans. The German verb verkitchen, which means quite literally to cheapen, is another likely source. The Oxford English Dictionary defines kitsch objects as characterized by worthless pretentiousness. That's a scathing review. But the exact origins of the term remain unknown. But it first gained um, traction in usage by German art dealers in Munich who were describing cheap artistic stuff replicas of paintings, kind of overused landscapes in the 1860s and 1870s. So the word kitsch does actually go quite far back. Kitsch takes the ordinary, the elements of mass culture that we're so immersed in that they barely even register on our radar anymore and attempts to reuse those motifs in order to satisfy what some theorists have called mass fantasies <coughs> and mass wish fulfillment. And I think this is really beautifully demonstrated in the dreamy and erotic photography of Parisian duo Pierre Le Gilles, who mimic religious iconography for their outlandish celebrity portraiture. Does anyone recognise who this is? Big, big Belgian pop star is making it big in England. He's playing at Wembley soon. It's called Stromae. Kitsch aesthetics as a whole attempt to seduce us by appealing to our love of glamour and appreciation for beauty nature and harmonious compositions. You'll notice that the surfaces in these images are either airbrushed of all perfections and smoothed out in this really pleasing way, or they're encrusted with really tactile detailing and completely overloaded, things like flowers, beads, shells, or other generic glitz. Well, what's really interesting about kitsch is what is perceived as, or even relegated as kitsch, is not a cultural constant. So motifs that at the time were seen as quite sincere, practical, or even tasteful can re-emerge and take on a new dimension of kitsch 
in modern times. So the first example of this that I'm going to talk about are food visuals from the 20th century. At the time, color photography and illustration was mostly used for commercial imagery, so anything that was considered to be high art by the establishment was still created in a moody and evocative monochromatic form of black, whites, and grays. These works of art played with light and shadow for impact rather than color palette. But food is a big business, and therefore the use of color visuals represented a new world of sometimes downright scary gastronomic possibilities. Proprietary food brands like Jell-O, Soylent Green, and Velveeta, an egg yolk yellow cheese substitute, transformed what was once produce into products. This was the imagery of a new super abundance that emerged in the wake of World War II. It is a blatant celebration of Western agricultural triumph, or perhaps simply of greed, indulgence, and decadence. The colors of the food on display are matched in vibrancy by the table settings and the interior surrounding them. More was always more in this context. The visuals that showed off these culinary advances embraced new, more vibrant, and cheaper to reproduce techniques of color and film photography and used printing to their fullest extent. Food coloring also became an important tool in any kitchen cupboard, allowing home cooks to get creative with presentation, particularly where party pieces were concerned, like the putty pink example of the party pink on the left. In the image on the right, a savory rainbow cake of sandwiches is suggested as a party centerpiece. And yes, in this instance, the thick outer layer of frosting is actually mayonnaise. <laughs> Advances in manufacturing, and I love mayonnaise, but you know, even I have my limits. Advances in manufacturing and chemical dyes and additives for food at the industrial scale gave almost all processed foods, however previously unappetizing, a jolt of vibrant colors. Reconstituted meats, for example, went from grayish to rosy putty pinks. Desserts embraced a range of pastel shades and often used exaggerated feminine motifs for impact, like frosted flowers. Kitsch is often criticized because it's seen as inauthentic, right? It's a style that imitates others without any meaningful substance of its own. If a food form itself could be kitsch, consider Velveeta spread. According to the Food and Drugs Administration, in the US, Velveeta is not technically real cheese, but rather a processed cheese product. And still, it brazenly apes the rich, buttery yellow color of a mature cheddar with the help of artificial additives that also contribute to its inarguably cheesy, but inevitably unnatural taste and smell. Velveeta satisfies our sensory desire for cheese through color, texture, and smell without fulfilling the criteria required to actually be cheese. Adverts from the Jello company back in the day warned homemakers not to let a week go by without serving one of their wobbly salads. Now, if you ever wanted to look at getting your greens in an entirely new light, trapping them in a prison of translucent green slime might certainly be one way to do it. Food companies soon realized that in order to capitalize on the market, visuals of these vibrant foodstuffs were among the most effective marketing techniques. These booklets were distributed to homes like magazines. They often included incentivizing coupons that could be redeemed in store, swiftly converting readers into buyers and hopefully down the line of brand evangelists. Even sardine companies distributed official pamphlets that carefully illustrated and considerately, considerately explained the features and benefits of their products, alongside recipe inspiration and ideas for plating up finished dishes that at least I think were intended to be appealing. As you can see from the uh, sardine cake on the left there, a very fetching green tablecloth. Now, most of the illustrators and photographers who would create this sort of artwork did remain anonymous. Being such a colorful and rich genre, at the time they were relegated to the commercial sphere. After all, fine art and high culture would never have accepted such saturated color palettes and maximalist approaches at the time. But there is something really kind of pleasurable and joyful in these images. 
They don't limit the vibrant colors to the food that they're displaying, but they have it spill over into the tablecloths, the crockery, the plastic flower bouquets that kind of deck out the table, the balloons in the background. We do feel a little bit like we're entering this kind of Willy Wonka-ish world of equally slightly wonky desserts. By the 1970s, food photography had surpassed food illustrations as the marketing medium of choice. As the 80s drew near, fast food options and ready meals began to supplant traditional recipes as the go-to option for many American households. Women entered the workplace in greater numbers and advertisers started to shift their spending from print media to television, which saw higher returns per dollar. The imagery of the kitsch kitchen faded away as convenience became more important than dinner party pieces or husband-approved home cooking. Although wear dishes like the bride will meet dollar concerns, that may be the best collective well-being. Aside from the trend for Instagrammable desserts, which are mostly now imported from Japan <coughs> and Korea, our recent food fetishes have been much less inspiring and also a lot less kitsch. I have a bit of a grudge with avocado, even though I had avocado for breakfast today. I feel it really represents the kind of dullness and fleetingness of our current food culture. If you think about it, avocados need chilies, paprika, really generous helpings of salt to create any impact of taste or visual whatsoever. If you leave one unpeeled for a day too long, it will turn this kind of really unappetizing muddy brown inside. Perhaps the avocado represents a rightful result, uh, revolt against processed, chemically spruced up offerings of the past. We return to nature with a kind of dull, lumpy paste on a slab of sourdough and pretend to be satisfied by it. The Kitsch Kitchen might disgust us with some of its more experimental food pairings and its consistent preoccupation with the rapid gelatination of almost anything, but at least it endeavored to inspire us. The imagery from this period is not only a really interesting record of the food habits of the Western world at the time, but a reminder of the golden era of entertaining when eating well and impressing guests was an integral part of what was ultimately a much less isolated urban society. If a great criticism of kitsch is that it is purely based on surface style and frivolous decoration, then employing this to delight party guests and spoil them with the care, time, and ingredients taken to create these displays seems among the most worthwhile deployments of the genre, even if the food starts to taste a bit sickly after a few bites. Is anyone hungry after that? Yeah, not at all. Anyway, moving on to our second cultural touch point of kitsch, that's cultural spelled with a K, of course, we have the evening bag. The evening bag eschews functionality for fantasy, often employing the visual tropes of bad taste to make a statement or act as a talking point. Its emphasis on decoration over utility makes it a form of kitsch, especially when designers make the most of this to push the limits of good taste and the blurring of high and low fashion forms. Evening bags usually rely on being tightly held by at least one hand throughout the evening, so they enjoy a particularly intimate physical relationship with the wearer. They are also by design generally extremely impractical. As such, they lend themselves to a degree of whimsy that would not be possible in, for example, the laptop bag product category. So you see a lot more experimental design with evening bags than you would other utilitarian styles. Their smallness is almost snobbish, why would anyone need anything but this slim, silky envelope after all? As American socialite Blaine Trump once said, you just want evening bags to disappear and be objects of amusement. The bags only come out at night and therefore only exist for play. Of course, some evening bags do embrace old school elegance, relying on meticulously branded metal hardware to designate them as objects of status and luxury. Others knowingly adopt kitsch aesthetics, forcing us to consider where novelty party prop and, society, and polite society clash, leaving a potentially unpalatable fashion taste in one's mouth. Their smallness suggests that a woman's needs are taken care of and that she does not have to carry items for all eventualities. They are the antithesis of the organic cotton tote bag, which has come to embody sustainable coffee shop, tabletop working culture, 
and are often made from illogical materials like organza, notoriously slippery, metal mesh, catches on everything, and even the superbly smashable seashell. Dolce & Gabbana's seashell bag from the late 1990s embodies the surface pleasures of kitsch and uses a material that crops up in other areas of the kitsch aesthetic, like ridiculous Baroque-inspired shell art. The shells are not only delicate, but noisy and a nuisance. Still, they're a talking point and invite others to swoon over your purse. And of course, the bag is lined with their signature leopard print fabric, another pattern that confidently straddles the designations of tackiness and luxury. There has been an almost complete collapse in the distinctions between high culture, mid culture, and lowbrow culture. This has been accelerated by movements like surrealism and pop art that made unexpected juxtapositions with familiar motifs and repurposed commercial motifs in a high art context, as in these crisp and sweet packet inspired Anya Heimarch bags from the early 2000s. This disintegration of clear categories of what you might have previously called good, bad, or popular taste has been further compli uh, complicated by phenomena like ironic consumption, in which consumers deliberately purchase or indulge in items or art they know to be bad taste. There has also been the creation of a market category called accessible luxury that has made designer pieces and the ownership of high-end items more normalized across social strata. The proliferation of the symbols of luxury often dilutes them, we start to see them everywhere. And the influence of streetwear and the omnipresence of counterfeit luxury products means that even bootleg designer items have become a desirable object in and of themselves. This phenomenon is kitsch in that the deception of the bootleg item is actually celebrated and takes on a new sort of value in an ironic, fun, tongue-in-cheek sort of sense. Herman Brock called this the lie that kitsch can tell, the highly considerate mirror that allows us to recognize ourselves in the counterfeit image it throws back at us and to confess our own lies with a delight which is to a certain extent sincere. That is, we see in the brazen fakery of imitation designer items a revelation of how artificially we present ourselves in the world and we choose to celebrate it rather than be ashamed of it. Gucci and Supreme have taken this sort of double bluff approach to the next level with their recent collaboration in which you can pay true luxury prices for an item that proudly states its own fake fakery. Does anyone want to guess how much this would set back? Uh, 200? <laughs> 850. Indeed. <laughs> Jeff Koons and Louis Vuitton also pushed the limits of real and fake with their collaboration that was a few years back now, I think this was around 2014. If kitsch mimics reality but is by definition falsified, its proliferation has only accelerated with the advent of industrial mass production. Whether it's copying a pre-existing work of art or assembling a false pretense of reality, the straightforwardness of kitsch puts itself as a visual contradiction. In many ways, it is a real forgery and it is not ashamed to declare itself as one. The influence of mass reproduction in this kind of homogenizing consumer culture is clear in tourist kitsch. Now, tourist kitsch is a visual style that uses the imagery and saturated color palettes of travel photographs and advertising slogans to make places feel desirable, to make us want to go there. ID Magazine wrote up about this trend and uh, they thought that it resurfaced as kitsch because these trinkets and objects are now almost completely obsolete. After all, when is the last time that you sent a postcard? These kind of items have become superfluous and nostalgic. They appeal to a sense of escapism and relaxation in the familiar turquoise seas and golden beaches. But perhaps the most pertinent example of the kitsch evening bag is the Judith Lieber Minaudière. The term Minaudière was coined after the verb minauder, meaning to simper or to charm. This was the apparent modus operandi of another American socialite, Florence Gold, who inspired the first version in 1933. 
The Minardier combines the functions of the handbag and the makeup compact in a rigid frame, allowing its owner to store little more than a credit card, lipstick, and cigarettes within. Although recently they have adapted slightly to accommodate the omnipresent iPhone and unwieldy vape as well. Each Tudor Fever bag takes between three and seven days to make, and they often take the form of extremely mundane items. Each Minaudier is bedazzled with thousands of tiny rhinestones coating the sculptural surface of the bag in ostentatious glitteriness. Feeding and crystallized embellishment are tactile, finicky, and labor intensive, which ought to give them a sense of exclusivity. But Lieber consciously counteracts this by opting for designs that mimic everyday objects, popular culture motifs, or trashy staples of American contemporary culture. The statement may not be a particularly original one, combining high craftsmanship with low culture, but its vulgarity remains effective as a form of sartorial satire that, that only the 1% that wants to skewer that only the 1% it wants to skewer can actually afford to engage in. As you can imagine, the prices for these start around £2,000 and go up to about £25,000, depending on the design. And of course, shininess still has strong connotations with femininity in the West, where most men long ago renounced their interest in gilded garments for stiff salvage denim and navy linens. The evening bag is a product that is knowingly impractical, often far too delicate, and retails at a price that renders its cost per wear shockingly inefficient. In many ways, it is the ultimate luxury, but accessorizing with an evening bag gives us permission to properly clock out of work and responsibility mode. Can you reach, my, can you reach me out of office? No, you can't, because my tiny bedazzled rose the size of my palm won't fit my phone or any paperwork. And that is a feeling that is increasingly hard to achieve, that feeling of pure release from responsibility. So the clutch therefore takes on a new connotation of freedom, and just like kitsch, allows us to indulge in those pleasures that we are told to feel guilty about. So to conclude, is there any value in kitsch? Are there any merits in kitsch and indeed in kitsch kittens? I think there is. Kitsch is often mocked or designated as tasteless tat, and that is not necessarily wrong. But I do think there are some good things to say about it as well. Kitsch gives us permission to enjoy things that we have long been told are not serious or high art or in good taste. It frees us to get lost in abundant mountain landscapes or rippling sunsets replete with majestic dolphin silhouettes or even the inviting sequin surface of an evening. Functionalism and utility are all well and good, but they should reinforce that they reinforce the idea that we should always be on, always multitasking, always on the go, always trying to extract the most amount of value from a single object. Kitsch says, slow down, and it's okay. We don't have to overthink this. Kitsch also challenges us to consider what is real, what is fake, what is really fake, or faking the real. It forces us to cast a more critical eye over the visuals we come into contact with and properly assess them. From the media we consume to the magazines we read, the clothes we wear and the art we see in museums. With screens an increasing feature of our life and deep fake technology and easy manipulations of visuals being used to guide popular perceptions of events, reality is increasingly being sold to us as negotiable. Kitsch prompts us to be more conscious of the limits of authenticity in context. I hope I have persuaded you that in this short journey in kitsch and colour, being useful and being frivolous are not in fact mutually exclusive. Kitsch offers us the comfort of nostalgia and sensory pleasures, like the plentiful plated up feasts of the past. It indulges us with decadent flourishes we've been commonly shamed into pretending we don't derive sincere enjoyment from, and perhaps most crucially, it engages our critical faculties as we read fashion, form, and flavor and are forced to consider what is ironic and what is earnest. Seeing the world with a healthy cynicism will not only leave us more freedom to enjoy the visuals around us, but also allow us to accept that sometimes the aesthetics of bad taste can still convey important 
and even good ideas about society and culture. Thank you very much. I hope that made a bit of sense. These are my contact details. Now I'm going to pass on to fabulous Janine Wilson, my colleague here at the university and an image maker in her own right. And we are going to get back into the second half of this, which is going to be a collage workshop. So that's yep. very exciting. That's Thank you, Janine. Yeah. I should clap you on, I think. No. <laughs> My name is Janine Wilson and I'm an image maker um, within photography more than any other medium and a lot of my work stems from autobiographical kind of scenarios or situations or memories and um, over kind of within the family and um, you know across certain years and I kind of use a lot of kind of symbolism and metaphor and motifs within the work that I do, um, which is what collage is all about. And it's a great medium to use um, that anybody can turn their hand to because it's not about kind of quality as such. It's about using your imagination and reappropriating cutouts of different medias and putting them together to make um, a whole new image. And it's really fun as well. So we thought it'd be really great to explore the world of kitsch um, through collage. But just to give you a little bit of a background about collage um, and kind of where its roots are. Weirdly, that's on the screen popped up on my screen. I think I'm going to have to scroll it down here. So yeah, so it's roots are within Dada and weirdly enough in, in the world that we're currently in, there are similarities that have been plucked out and um, that we're kind of all really um, aware of within the news and the current kind of situation. Um, but Dada became, it was due to how um, almost terrible um, kind of the world was and um, how dark things could become that a new medium and a new art form um, came out of that, which was to do with expressing those viewpoints and opinions, um, but putting them together in a way where it combined kind of text plus um, almost cartoonish um, imagery, along with kind of um, advertisements um, that were all kind of put together to create kind of a piece, um, which the Dardais kind of, um, what's the word, invented or, or kind of came up with this term. And it was to do with, the term actually is nonsensical, it doesn't mean anything, but that in itself was an art movement because it was anti-art. So they're all about creating art as a form of anti-expression. Um, so it was kind of the beginnings really of like modern art and modernist thinking. Um, so there were kind of lots of you know of pioneers of collage um, who we're going to look at particularly is Richard, Ham Richard Hamilton which was really coined um, the mid and created the first iconic collage um, which was it within the kind of pop art culture um, so this the title of this collage um, just what it is that makes this home so different and appealing is kind of, I guess, drawing on themes of overconsumption, um, the things that became important in the 50s, um, just kind of the, the mass kind of society and, and kind of 
what became important to those, those people at those times. Um, oh, sorry, I think you're there. <laughs> it's actually quite odd. I'm, rather than reading it at a screen, I'm always kind of talking towards kind of the bottom things. Um, so it's a really um, interesting creative output. It's really accessible to anybody and it's, I guess because it was non-art, um, there was lots of debate of whether these pieces um, could actually become art in some way, shape or form. Um, and it references cultural kind of references, popular culture um, and kind of iconography. Um, and they've all played a huge and major influence since the late 1940s. Yeah, so symbolism, metabolic motifs are woven into collage technique. Um, and it's possibly due to its laid and fragmented form um, and reappropriating kind of just anything often around you and then putting that into kind of laying and juxtaposing images together and textures and colours together. So yeah, so I kind of, um, as part of my work, really looked at pitch and kind of how that translates and what I think of pitch and what my parents think of pitch and what my grandparents thought pitch was. Um, and it's definitely, as Louisa says, within generations, it kind of evolves into different things, which is to do with like just mass over flooding and over saturation, often which tends to make it feel cheap or tacky. Um, but to another generation that can have um, really interesting and humorous and satirical kind of irony within it. So it's to do with kind of lots of different stages, I think, that um, items eventually become pitch. Um, so this was um, a photograph that I took when I was a student. And um, this is of my Nana's living room. Um, and I'm from a working class background and um, I'm from Middlesbrough. And um, I did a project which was about people's, well, it was entitled Dogs and Dogs because it was to do with this idea that if you have a pet, um, that you become obsessed with collecting little ornaments and, and little trinkets and things about that. Um, so my Nana's house um, was kind of full of all these collectibles and there's a humour and a certain satire obviously involved in that as an observation. And it's a really interesting thing because I remember when, when I first started this series, um, you know, it was on my street um, and I wasn't looking at class um, and society what, as what I thought it would be at the time. Of course, that just came into it because of people's interiors and what they did. But it was like a study about just regular people that I knew and what their living rooms kind of looked like and the idea that they collected these kind of trinkets and things. Um, and this is Meg here. And, you know, obviously the humour is, is that the ornament, um, you know, is kind of like almost matching and mirroring kind of Meg. Um, but even when I was thinking, I remember this image and sorry, it's quite low quality. It was um, a film, it's, it's kind of shot on film. And this is a scan of the film, so it, it, it's kind of got a little bit of grain on it. But I was trying to recollect my memories of the interiors of like my um, nana and granddad's house and my mum and dad's house. Because I do, when I see something kitsch, I, the, the nostalgia of it or the warmth I feel towards it. And I really love it because it's familiar to me. And we've got cine film footage of, you know, like, purple and turquoise swirly carpets and um, you know orange swirly curtains it was just like you know on the eye it was quite you know an onslaught on the eye um, and even thinking um, when it's actually blown up to this size I can see just in that the mirror there there's like a Toby joke which my nana collected um, those you know I'm not going to say it is because it's kitchen you know it's all a matter of taste um, but yeah, she they were her like prized collection along with dog ornaments. Um, so for, for what is one person's I'm gonna let me start this again. What is for one person kitsch, for others it can be a perfect piece of art. Um, 
to just go on. So just looking at some kind of image makers, um, photographers that have kind of embraced and looked at Kitsch. Um, so this is Home Sweet Home by Martin Hall. And I'm sure he's a pretty kind of well-known name. Um, so I'm sure you may have heard of him before. But he had an exhibition in the Impressions Gallery of York where he actually converted it into his living room um, of his parents' house. And his images, it was a documentary project, and his images were framed in the way that they would be within you know, the home. So it was called Home Sweet Home. And it was again just a, a really interesting observation about kind of what we grew up being surrounded by. Um, yeah, and, and he also did, and these are quite humorous as well, you know, he has taken a, a obviously a huge backlash from people saying that, you know, like you presenting people within this kind of class system and not in the best light. Um, he has done kind of people that have a very wealthy lifestyle and showed kind of the idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic kind of parts of of how they present themselves and how they kind of decor their own homes. But I always remember this um, project really fondly because um, it's the first time that I saw a bit of work and I actually recognized that it was um, an environment of which I it was kind of like a part of and I, I wasn't sure that that was art or if it could become art. So it was kind of quite interesting for me to discover this obviously after um, he kind of published this. But he into this was a BBC documentary series as well, um, and just some of the kind of he interviewed um, the people that allowed him into their home, and just some of the kind of the comments that they made. <coughs> I really like this one here. Um, when I looked at the wallpaper and the wallpaper looked at me, we instantly fell in love. And just like that Sanderson, like this over high hyper clash scenario. Um, and she obviously is, is, is kind of divinely in love with kind of the living room and, and it's her home. And then we've got, um, I don't think it's anything particularly forced on Deborah, but we've all always enjoyed the same sorts of things. Um, so it's just this kind of um, mother-daughter kind of relationship there and the, and the chairs, you know, and it, it has obviously been subjectively photographed by the photographer who, would have noticed these kind of similarities and, and, and everything but I think it's just kind of quite an interesting study it's quite humorous and fun um, yeah he's done lots of other things um, just about really uh, specifically the Britishness of kind of um, different groups of people um, which I always found quite interesting yes so we now arrive at our kitsch collage workshop um, yeah. so <laughs> um, so basically what we'd like you to do is we have publications um, and we have scissors and we have glue and we've got some paper and what we'd like you to do is to experiment and have a go at putting your own kitsch collages together and um, they can take on a whole host of different, you know, you can do collages in many different styles. Um, I've got some images from a collage artist who's Gateshead based, um, who is called Graham Hopper. Um, and he kind of uses, they're quite cleanly cut out and he's quite interested in one thing extending into another, which I think is quite an interesting style. Or you can, like the previous um, work that we saw was a lot cruder, it was a lot more kind of rough and slightly kind of undone in some way. So that's completely down to you and what you feel like your style could be. Um, it's good when you're flicking through magazines, I guess is to think about when you stop at something and take a look, is, is that like what, you know, like um, what does that remind you of? Um, and what is it a symbol of or a motif of and what could it kind of go against uh, so you know some really interesting kind of pieces of work i'm sure will be produced in the next in this session this next part so um i guess without further ado oh there was a little tip of um, if you don't glue it, things down directly to begin with it just means you can move them around to start to get like a feel for the space and I guess the picture that you're building. Uh, yes. Next question. Um, I, I don't know whether you 
do all these colours and sell them. But what's the deal? If you're also like popping up in these magazines, mm -hmm. I don't know, for example, a clothing hero magazine, and yeah. I don't know, they're popping out of Staple and then they're popping out, I don't know, I mean, I suppose people might have that go along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a, 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 a big lab or something. And then you make your own art. Do you have the rights to that? What's, I, I can yeah. I don't understand how people. So, so what you've done. Like, I know it is the right sort of digital. Yeah. Um, you know, on Instagram, someone tap, someone gives credit, don't they, to everything. Yeah. What's the deal, paper-wise? Um, because you're taking an image and um, reappropriating it into a different piece of artwork, mm -hmm. that you are the author of that collage. The images within them, um, you know, it. Yeah, I can understand why you would think that, particularly if it con contains labels and, and kind of mm. trademarks and things like that but um, pop art was all about that it was taking you know the mass um, imagery mm. and reappropriating it into something else and so collage is completely new if you created a collage like this made up of many different things then you would be the author yes that there tends to be a general rule that if you make seven changes to an image mm -hmm. That that is kind of seen as the legal precedent. If you're presenting it in a different area, if you're maybe adding three things around it, tearing it, changing the colour, inverting it, seven changes. That's yeah. the general rule. And it's got to be formulated into something else completely different. Um, so it shouldn't bear, you know, any resemblance to the original artwork. Thank you. We've got two tables around the front. I think probably we'll be okay across two tables. So there's the one just here on the left, and then there's one next to the window. So if you'd like to kind of get yourself comfortable over there, thank you for coming. And we're going to come and bring the supplies, and then we'll get to the sticking.